As we begin our evangelism journey, we come to Paul's letter to the Ephesians, chapter 1, verses 7 to 13. In Christ we are set free by the blood of his death, and so we have forgiveness of sins. How rich is God's grace, which he has given to us so fully and freely. God, with full wisdom and understanding, let us know his secret purpose. This was what God wanted, and he planned to do it through Christ. His goal was to carry out his plan when the right time came, that all things in heaven and on earth would be joined together in Christ as the head. In Christ we were chosen to be God's people, because from the very beginning God had decided this in keeping with his plan. And he is the one who makes everything agree with what he decides and wants. We are the first people who hoped in Christ, and we were chosen so that we would bring praise to God's glory. So it is with you. When you heard the true teaching, the good news about your salvation, you believed in Christ. And in Christ, God put his special mark of ownership on you by giving you the Holy Spirit that he had promised. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thank you, Sharon. It's been said that the E-word, evangelism, has replaced sex and money as that which should not be spoken in the mainline church. Christian book publishers say that a book with the E-word in the title is the kiss of death at the box office. And studies have found that many, many mainline church members and pastors feel awkward, embarrassed, uncomfortable, defensive, and even sometimes angry when the E word is mentioned. Interesting enough, we don't have an E committee, an evangelism committee, any longer at all at Bethel. In fact, when I got here, we, it was a committee of two people, Robin and Gary Mitchell, and its sole purpose was to do the live nativity. I'm sure that if we go far enough back, uh, there was more that happened. Because if you go far enough back, there probably was an amen corner in this church. Uh, now we have just Milton as uh, our amen corner. Uh, we had camp meetings that were a part of our rich United Methodist tradition that goes back to the early 19th century, well into the 20th century, along with the Presbyterian Church. We had revivals that uh, really uh, stirred the hearts of people. But for whatever reason, those have kind of faded into um, disuse. And now we have generations of pastors who have little or no training in evangelism. And worse than that, many have had no positive personal experience themselves with evangelism. Today, only one in six mainline denominational seminaries require a course in evangelism, or even half a course in evangelism. I l remember when I was in seminary at United, they, as far as I know, they did not have a course in evangelism, certainly did not require one, although they do today, uh, and it's a requirement. Methesco, as far as I can tell, I know it's not required, and I'm not even sure it's on the uh, curriculum. American pastors say their greatest frustration in ministry is their inability to convey the gospel in today's culture. How sad. It's a story that needs to be told, and it's so vibrant to every age. Let us pray. So, Lord, we do have a story to tell to the nations that will turn their hearts to the right. It's a story that is current and welcomed and so relevant to every day and every age. So embolden us in this time together so that we can truly proclaim the good news of Jesus Christ. Let us not sit on our hands. Amen. 
Well, let's look for a moment at uh, this Ephesian text from Paul. It starts off by saying, in Christ we are set free by the blood of His death. And so we have forgiveness of sins. I want you to remember about being set free by the blood as I speak to you and as we come to the table. In verse 11 it says, In Christ we were chosen to be God's people because from the very beginning, from the very beginning of time, God had decided this in keeping with His plan, plan for the universe. We, now Paul's talking to the people then, we are the first people who hoped in Christ and we were chosen so that we would bring praise to His glory. So it is with you, with you and me. When you heard the true teaching, the good news about your salvation, you believed in Christ. And in Christ, God has put a special mark of ownership on you. It started with your baptism by giving you the Holy Spirit that He had promised. I'm going to be talking about a mainline evangelism project that's contained in this book, Unbinding the Gospel, Real Life Evangelism. It's by Martha Grace Reese. She's a corporate attorney and a former congregational pastor She's been a church consultant and a researcher. And along with the Lilly Endowment grant, a four-year grant, uh, this Mainline Evangelism Project studied congregations in seven denominations. The American Baptist Church, the Disciples of Christ, Lutherans, Presbyterians, the Reformed Church, and the, uh, well, the UCC and the United Methodist Church. They interviewed 1,200 church members, new Christians, pastors, seminarians, professors, even kids in youth groups. They scoured statistics, they visited churches, and their purpose was actually to find churches that were doing effective evangelism and discover what made that work? What was their motivation? Here was the most important discovery they found, that a vivid, growing relationship with God lies at the heart of real evangelism. So as we talk about deepening our faith through all of the spiritual disciplines, that's the key to being effective in evangelism. At its core, evangelism is people sharing with others their personal understandings that life is better, life is richer, life is truer if one has faith in Christ and lives in a faith community. Faith sharing changes the person that is sharing it. They begin as you talk about your faith. They begin to see coincidences that they will start calling God instances. They'll see more and more answer to prayer. They'll see more and more miracles as they talk about their faith. And they'll become more aware of the promptings uh, from the Spirit. Martha Rees found that talking about faith one-on-one and working within the church becomes actually Addictive. She says it becomes completely addictive once you really get into it. She found that those people who talk about their faith never want to go back to the times where they had a muted faith. So what do you think about when you hear the E word? This comes from her book. One person says, no, I don't want to knock on strangers' doors and give them some pamphlet. I don't want to be a Jehovah Witness. Someone else said, I think of a tele-evangelist asking for money for some theme park when I think of evangelism. 
Another person said, my college roommate kept hammering me about salvation and trying to talk me into giving my life to Christ. But yet, and I will talk about this, there is amazing campus ministry going on through Campus Crusade for Christ, through Fellowship of Christian Athletes, and through our own campus ministry that we have right here at Bethel Church. Another person says, I know we're supposed to talk with people about faith and invite them to church, but I don't want to lose friends. And I feel guilty. Another person says, I don't think we should do evangelism. It implies other religions are wrong. And another person said, if a congregation really focuses on evangelism, it doesn't do much with justice issues or deal with the systemic effects of racism. Hmm. What word does evangelism bring to mind to you? Here's what, here are the words that brought to mind to people in the study. Pushy? Embarrassing? Uncomfortable? Going to hell? Awkward? Tracks? Pressuring? Tammy Faye Baker? Remember her? Bible thumpers? We're so guarded. Uh, We're we're so reluctant and timid. Uh, Someone said, how can I do evangelism when I believe that many paths lead to God? Why do I think I know enough to tell someone what to believe? What if someone asks a question and I don't know the answer to it. Learning to talk about our faith is what we're going to be doing during this whole season of Epiphany right up till the time of Lent. People sometimes learn how to talk about their faith when they attend retreats, when they're involved with small group ministries, when they do Bible studies. I love what Annie Dillard wrote. I don't know how many of you like to read Annie Dillard. Annie Dillard, she's a, uh, a contemporary uh, fiction writer, but oftentimes writes about faith issues. And she says, I can't believe how many in the church know so much about God's grace, but don't understand the power of what it has to share. It's madness, she writes, to wear ladies' straw hats and velvet hats to church. We should all be wearing crash helmets. Ushers should issue life preservers and signal flares. They should lash us to our seats. Because there's power in the blood. And a lot of you know that Him. I can't believe as I looked it up, it isn't in our United Methodist hymnal. It, i got to go back years and years and years in hymnals before I hear, I can see that. And yet you can sing along with me. There is power, power, wonders working power in the blood of the Lamb. There is power, power, wonder working power in the precious blood of the Lamb. You know that, don't you? Would you be free from the burden of sin? There's power in the blood, power in the blood. Would you, or evil, a victory win? Would you be free from your passion and pride? Come for a cleansing to Calvary's tide. There's wonderful power in the blood. Would you be whiter, much whiter than snow? There's power in the blood, power in the blood. Sin stains are lost in its life-giving flow. There's wonderful power in the blood. Would you do service for Jesus, our, your King? There's power in the blood, power in the blood. Would you live daily His praises to sing? There's wonderful power in the blood. I've always heard no matter what faith you're in, that if you're a convert, they, are, they make the best Catholics, they make the best Jews, they make the best Christians. Why is it that when somebody comes into the faith and they, they learn about that faith, that they want to they exude it, they want to talk about it? 
Um, as I worked with a lot of Jews in the Dayton community, they would say, we just love converts to Judaism. They become the leaders in the church. Because, you know, we have these C&E Christians. Uh, they come at, Christian, uh, at, at Christmas and Easter. Well, they have what I guess you would call um, P&R Christians. They come at Passover, or Jews. They come at Passover and Rosh Hashanah, the Jewish New Year, Yom Kippur. But there's something about being grabbed by the Holy Spirit. A few Sundays ago, and I didn't realize this is, this is a fairly common phenomenon. I was watching an NFL game, and I can't remember which game it was. And I noticed that right after the game, and it was just for an instant, uh, and it was kind of a sidebar as the, the cameras were interviewing uh, the coaches, I saw a group of players that ha were from both teams in the a circle in the field, and I obviously they were praying. And I was intrigued about that, and so I looked uh, it up, and, and uh, I noticed that they've been doing this since a Monday night football game back in the early 90s when the San Francisco 49ers and the New York Giants met at midfield. Buffalo Bills chaplain Fred Rain says the prayer is not really about who won or who lost. It's about honoring God and guys who really look at their talents and their abilities and the privilege to play in the NFL as a gift from God. It's a chance just to give thanks. You know, a lot of us, sometimes we say, you know, when somebody scores a touchdown and they give it one of these and... And they, you know, you're almost turned off about that. Why are you only giving it one of these when you excel? And why is it that you only talk about God's grace when you're rolling into the end zone when scoring a touchdown? It's a valid question, but I'd much rather see people jumping and rolling into the end zone and raising their fingers high when they're scoring a touchdown than some of the other stupid antics uh, that you see happening when people always want to bring the attention to themselves when they do something great and they give the strength thing and they, they do all the things that we see them do. I understand now that that phenomena, that taking a knee after the games uh, affects some colleges. So I'm going to kind of be watching uh, for that. Uh, this picture that you see there is uh, of the, this, that last one was of the New Orleans Saints and the Indianapolis Colts in uh, a preseason game this year. That picture that you see is actually of a rugby team. So it's affecting all sports. This was a game uh, af uh, after the game between England and Samoa. And look how many people are gathered around. And then in your bulletin this morning, you see... Uh, this picture. This is a world-renowned soccer player named Kaka who plays for Brazil and this is uh, after a game with Liverpool uh, where he and some of his others uh, on the team wore this shirt, I belong to God. But you know when you think about it, when we do belong to God, and that was the message of Paul in evangelism, we need to share that. Uh, it, our faith does not, should not be a muted faith. And the only way that you feel like sharing it is that you have to come into a deeper, closer relationship with Jesus Christ. It's got to come out of your head and into your heart. The more you pray, the more you do Bible study, the more you meditate, uh, the more you are drawn closer to this Christ, and the more then you can't help but talk about it. And if you talk about it, you'll be awfully surprised how you can affect the lives of others in the workplace, in your neighborhood, in the grocery store, on your school, campus, uh, there is a story to be told, and the story is alive and within you. But you've got to 
draw closer to Christ. Because once you do, in all of these spiritual disciplines, you understand more and more the sacrificial nature. And you do start, as you pray more and pray more and pray more, you do start seeing things happen in your life that are more than just coincidence. And you do have, your, your eyes will be open to more and more of these God moments. And even these miracles. When we lead a, and, and I'm a part of a mission team in Belize for those 10 days, and we are praying constantly and we're singing constantly and we're, we're talking about what's happening in our lives down there. All of a sudden we see things that we wouldn't see any other time. And it's so beautiful when we start opening our eyes. And then we want to tell other people about it. And that's why you'll find that some of the people that come back from mission trips, they're so on fire. And the challenge is to keep that fire burning. And the only way you do that is to replicate what you do when you're on a mission trip. So we're going to try to, during this these five Sundays together. We're going to try to take the mystique off this E word and try to reclaim some of our roots, which are very evangelical within the United Methodist Church. Uh, I want to hear from our evangelical friends. I, want to, I, I love to be close to those that like to talk and love to talk about Jesus because they infect me. Uh, and, it, and there is such a story to be told. And the more I tell it, then the more I start seeing the ways of God all around me. And that's exciting. So it just becomes a, a self-perpetuating thing. That's how we fill up pews on Sunday morning. Uh, that's how we bring our families into the faith. Uh, we have to be willing to share it and to talk about it. There is wondrous power in the blood of the Lamb. And we've taken on that commitment, haven't we? When we claim Jesus Christ and when we sing blessed assurance, Jesus is mine, this is a story, this is my story, this is my song, praising my Savior. When? On Sunday mornings? all the day long. It's a good thing, friends. It's a good thing. And it'll make your life richer and fuller. I look forward to this time together in the weeks ahead.